please welcome Mariana Mattis. Thank you, Rob, for the invitation. Um, Rob and I met at MIT a couple of years ago. I, I finished a PhD there. I am a computational biologist, and I am working at the intersection of public health and AI, which is not something that you hear very often. Usually when you think about AI and improving health outcomes, you immediately think about precision medicine and personalizing medicine. And what I want to communicate to you today is that there's much more we can do to improve human health and other areas of application. So I am ready to bet that if we raised our hands, most people here have read about the opioid epidemic, heard about the opioid epidemic, or been touched personally by the opioid epidemic. This is Nancy Shipman. She lost her 19-year-old son to a heroin overdose. He was left addicted after knee surgery and taking prescription opioids that his doctor gave him. Unfortunately, stories like Nancy, tragedies like Nancy's, have become all too common in news headlines. In fact, the CDC estimates that 130 people die every day of an opioid overdose in the US. This has become the leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 50. And besides this devastating human loss, the opioid crisis represents an economic burden of over $440 billion per year. This has been fairly called the worst drug crisis in American history. Now you may wonder, well, how did we get here? This epidemic has evolved faster than health officials can react. Here you can see a series of maps that show you how the opioid crisis rippled across the US from 1999 to 2014. You can see it really has touched most places in our country. And you may also notice something interesting. This visualization was built by the New York Times in late 2017. Yet, the last data point is 2014, three years before it was built. The reason for that is because the best data available to understand and react to the opioid epidemic is counting how many people die. And this data is hugely delayed, months or years delayed. By the time we're looking at it, we're not looking at the people who are alive today and could receive help. This data truly keeps us looking backwards when we need to be moving forward and not, not, not only understanding what's happening today, but what's going to happen tomorrow. Even worse, this data is what government officials used to allocate billions of dollars of government aid every year. So if you are a city or a state that has a lot of opioid overdose deaths, you get more money to deal with it. Do you see a problem with that logic? The problem is that, sure, the intention is good of sending resources to the areas that are more affected, but the incentive is wrong. We have heard again and again of localities that actually start reducing their overdose numbers, and what happens is instead of getting more support to continue the efforts that are being successful, now they are getting less money. So the incentives are misaligned because we are measuring the wrong thing. The solution that we came up with at Biobot was to map opioid consumption near real time. We equip health officials and emergency responders with monthly data with the consumption of over 20 different types of opioids with zip code level resolution. And even more importantly, we produce this data 
anonymously. We do it by tapping into an unexpected source of data, our sewage. Every time we flush the toilet, we part with valuable information about our health. The only situation is that it's out of sight and out of mind. So people have never really thought about leveraging it as a source of data about population health. Now imagine being able to collect all of this data in real time. Imagine building a public health analytics engine powered by everyone in a city, not just by those people who can afford to buy the latest health diagnostics item from your home, but that includes everyone because, well, everyone pees every day. At Biobot, we're not only imagining this future, we are building it. We are the first company in the world to transform urban infrastructure into public health observatories. This is a picture of my co-founder Nusha and I. She's an, we met at MIT. She's an architect, I am a computational biologist, and we bring together the emerging fields of the human gut microbiome and smart cities to really create this novel type of diagnostic for government officials. Now let's get into how this works. We first start by mapping out a city's wastewater map. Here you can see Cambridge, Massachusetts, where we can layer the sewer network on top of land use and census data so that we can identify the best sampling sites to represent the city. We also built our own hardware that can be deployed at the selected sampling sites by local utilities department. Our vision is that one day, this little box will sit into manholes across cities in the world and will be directly transmitting health information into the cloud. Today, we're starting by building hardware that collects the right samples and captures the drugs that we care about into an easy to transport cartridge. We then bring that cartridge back to our lab. We use mass spectrometry, which is a type of chemical analysis, and we can measure the concentration of over 20 different types of opioids. Here is a partial list of what we measure today. You can see we can look at different types of prescription opioids, oxycodone, codeine, tramadol. We can look at different types of illicit opioids, such as heroin, fentanyl, and new synthetic drugs. We can look at Narcan, the overdose reversal drug. We can look at treatment medications for opioid misuse, such as, meth such as methadone. And we, we can even look at emerging trends like cocaine, meth, meth, synthetic cannabinoids. And as a positive control, we included caffeine, since we think that should be pretty much everywhere. Another good part of this tech approach is that we can easily expand to measure any drug or pharmaceutical product that we care about. From the same samples that we already collected, and can do it even retroactively as we expand our targets. Now I want to tell you a bit about our pilot results. Our first customer actually found us. We were just spinning off MIT. We hadn't built the product yet, we hadn't fundraised, and they found us and got in touch with us. This is the town of Cary, North Carolina an affluent, suburban, well-educated community outside Raleigh in the Research Triangle. And the reason they got in touch with us is because 
they had seen an increase in overdoses over the past two years, and they, didn't ha they don't have a local health department that could advise the mayor's office on what to do about it. Now let me show you what we found. This is an anonymized map of Kerry. First, what we're showing here is the data that they already have. This is a map of reported non-fatal overdoses in their town. This data is collected from 911 calls, from emergency service calls to ambulances. So town officials knew that overdoses in their town are clustered in the one part of the city that you can see over there. Here, what I'm showing you is data that we collected for them during the pilot. This is the total amount of opioids we measured in these different neighborhoods in their town. And interestingly, we didn't see the same that they already knew. What we saw is that opioid consumption was fairly consistent across all areas of the town. Here you can see the maps side by side. It was really striking to see that they don't really match at all. And that actually it's opioid consumption, it's just something that is happening in every type of community, regardless of the socioeconomic background or other characteristics. This really told them that they needed to take into account all sorts of communities and not just the area they already knew about. More importantly, we told them that what was driving those numbers were prescription opioids and not so much heroin or fentanyl, but it was about a prescription opioid problem. With these two pieces of information, they designed an outreach campaign basically talking about the importance of discarding medications that you may have at home and ad advertising their medication drop-off location. In just six months of working with us to craft this message, the results were outstanding. They saw a three-fold increase in the use of their medication drop-off location as compared to previous years. And more importantly, for the first time in three years, they saw a reduction in the number of overdoses. Really showing how you can be very effective in your interventions and have results quickly. This year, we'll continue working with Kerry, producing monthly data so that they can stay on top of any changes in these results. But before we go there, let me just tell you quickly about something that we learned from the data and that we were not expecting at all. We found that we can actually measure overdose rescues in sewage. And you may wonder, okay, how does that work? So one of the molecules that we measure is Narcan. That spray, or injection that you administer on a person that has overdosed to bring them back. Narcan was initially just used by ambulance services or by hospitals, but in recent years, government has made it available like everywhere. You can buy Narcan from any pharmacy, just over the counter. There are many programs that give Narcan away for free. And the idea is that people can use it, you know, right away on their families, on their friends, without having to call the ambulance. And basically what we saw is that if we measure Narcan in sewage, it's giving us the same heat map, the same information as ambulances, which is super interesting. But even more interesting was actually that we found about 30 times more Narcan in the wastewater than expected based on reported numbers. Also really highlighting that, you know, people know about Narcan, people are using Narcan, 
and that that intervention has been successful, but also you know, limits the possibility of connecting people to treatment. So it's important to stay ahead of this. Looking into the future, as I mentioned, what Kerry wants is an early warning system for any change in their drug use patterns. They want to know if it's not just about prescription opioids, but if there's now heroin, which is more potent, if there is fentanyl, carfentanyl, or any of dozens of new opioids that now have inundated our country. Here you can see, it's really, really impressive. When I saw this picture, I couldn't really believe it, but what you can see is the lethal dose of different types of opioids. And for the case of molecules like fentanyl or carfentanyl, it's tiny, tiny, like, you know, grain salt size type of chemicals that can cause um, death uh, to the point where even now emergency responders have to be very careful when they go to rescue an overdose because if there's any of this powder just left in the scene, the emergency responders are overdosing on it. Just by touching, by breathing, it's, it's really, really scary. And um, these new synthetics are actually what are driving most of the overdoses uh, across the country nowadays. It's not longer other types. Um, now, let's take a step back and let's go back to, you know, public health. And to us, it made a lot of sense to start with opioids because it's such a big problem. But it's important to not forget that public health cares about other things outside opioids. And that actually people feel like they have been ignoring, um, in a way, you know, their job looking at other things. But we hear a lot of interest in painting them a full picture, not just looking at opioids, but, you know, looking at infectious disease, you know, that hepatitis, um, measles are becoming now an, a thing again here in our country, uh, looking at antibiotic resistance, nutrition. There's really many types of data you can obtain from wastewater. And just to close up my talk, I want to share with you um, a few learnings, a few personal learnings from working in this space. So first, I want to go back to say, you know, using AI to improve health outcomes doesn't have to be just about precision medicine at the individual level. We can work at the community level to deliver interventions at the right time, with the right message, and that really make a difference. Now, imagine if we were not just stopping and solving the opioid crisis as quickly as we can, but if we could stop the next epidemic from taking place in the first place. Because we saw the early signs in time, we acted, and we don't find ourselves in this situation again. As others have mentioned, privacy and transparency are front and center in the conversation. From the moment that you're collecting this innovative type of data with lots of applications, you know, people, fairly get nervous about what could be the consequences of producing this data and putting it out there. So to us, you know, it's really important to be part of that conversation because this data is not even regulated. How will it be regulated? I want to say as a quick note that contrary to most tech startups, when you're working with, you know, sensitive type of data with government, in this post-Theranos era, you know, government officials now demand technical due diligence. So there's a high bar for your product and for the quality of what you're putting out there. And, you know, this could be a whole other conversation, but not only we're innovating in our product and market, we are pioneers in the startup world. It's not very common to see companies selling to government. It's not very common to see bio companies not doing biotech. Um, or, you know, now it's becoming more common to see very mission-driven companies. But at the end of the day, what motivates us is the potential to create 
fundamental technology that exists in every city in the world and is making a difference. So, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, that was outstanding. I have two questions. Um, what does this cost for a city to roll out and to use? And the second is, the Trump administration has said that opioid reduction is one of their focuses. Do you have an introduction to them so that you can get leverage from government funds? Um, yes, so um, for a city, our contract sizes are in the order of um, 50 to 400K per year. So it's really very, um, very affordable technology that can exist in most locations. And indeed, we already have connections um, to very high level government officials in the administration, um, not yet directly to, to the president himself, <laughs> but, um, but to Kelly Ann Conway, uh, we're hoping to meet soon since she is the point person within the administration that cares about this. And already with forming relationships with uh, HHS, CDC, SAMHSA. Okay, one more question. Thank you so much. I'm wondering about the lessons that you've already been learning and how those are being shared. I'm wondering if that's like an open source model because this is not something to keep secret, like a secret IP that you're trying to keep under the sofa. So maybe you could say something about what you're inviting people into in terms of an ongoing conversation from the learnings. Absolutely. I would say um, the most important question here is how this data is um, shared and published so that others can learn from it. What we have seen is that, um, you know, right now, since we have very few customers, they are nervous to be the first ones to put this data out there and to, you know, maybe receive backlash from the public opinion. So what we're hoping is to foster uh, this group for a little longer. Between them, they know each other, they talk, and then, you know, at some point, I think we'll reach critical mass where it's not special anymore, it's more like most are doing it. 